This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less tax. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So we've been talking about government incentives. My new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, goes through seven uh, seven investments the government will literally pay you to make. So what if those investments, just how big are they? What if those investments could actually, the, the incentives um, from the government actually pay for a new car? Um, what if they can even pay for a Ferrari? So this is actually the last chapter of my book. And I'm very grateful and very, we're very fortunate to have actually the person that chapter is about, the, the true life example here, Brad Sumrock. Brad and I have been friends for many, many years and worked together for many years. And uh, it's just great to have you on the show, Brad. Thank you so much for coming. Can you just uh, tell our listeners a little bit about you and kind of your journey and where this came from? Sure, Tom, I'm really happy to be here today. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And I'm excited to talk about the Ferrari, but <laughs> that lights me up, man. It's fun, especially when the government pays for it. I mean, who wouldn't want the government to buy or pay for a Ferrari, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, look, like so many people out there, you know, I, I wasn't born with a silver spoon. I never thought I would be in the position that I'm in right now. Um, just like rich dad, poor dad teaches you know, my parents were barely middle class. They taught me to study hard, go to college, get good grades, stay out of debt, save my money, diversify my investments, and pray that I die before I run out of money. That was the paradigm that I was raised in. <clears throat> and then I read Kiyosaki's books, and I took massive action, and I sought out specialized education. Because Kiyosaki says specialized education can make you a fortune, and formal education can get you a job. And so I went to real estate seminars and I joined a mentorship program. And at the time, I didn't want to tell any of my friends because I was embarrassed. Like this was a five-figure investment I made in myself, but it worked. And eight months later, I bought my first investment property ever. And it was a 32-unit apartment building. And I'll just fast forward. That was in 2000 and, uh, 2002. In 2005, I quit my job because I, have a, I had enough passive income from my apartments to cover all my bills. <clears throat> and so I was able to walk away from a six figure job in 2005. <clears throat> and then since then I've syndicated and I've switched from buying deals myself to syndicating deals for a variety of reasons that, that we could also talk about, but I've syndicated now over 10,000 units and a decade ago started a platform for educating and mentoring people that also want to syndicate apartments. So that's my two businesses is buying and owning apartments and mentoring others that want to buy and own apartments. So we got together, uh, <clears throat> if I recall, about um, five years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, give us a little of that story, Brad, of, uh, you know, where that came from and what was going on in your life at the time. Yeah, so when we met, I was already, um, you know, a multimillionaire um, and had focused most of my time and energy on income. So we were making a lot of money from apartments, cash flow, uh, capital gains, buying, holding, selling over a three to seven year period, multiple transactions per year. And then we also started, me and my wife also started this education platform and that became you know, a seven and eight bigger company in terms of revenue. So we were so focused on building and earning income that I took my eye off the ball on the taxes. And when I met you, we had paid a million, almost a million dollars in tax. And I even used to think, because my original real estate mentor said there were four types of millionaires. And he said, the first type is when your net worth is over a million. And I checked that box many, many years ago. The second type is when you have a million liquid. I checked that box. The third type is when you make a million a year. I checked that box. And the fourth type, he said, was when you pay a million in tax. And so I even had it in my blueprint that 
that was the nirvana because to pay a million in tax must mean you're making what three, four, five million dollars a year. And so, you know, as our income went, our net income was going up, our taxes was going up, but I actually felt like, well, this is normal. Like, this is okay. This is the way it's supposed to be. Until I was at speaking at an event. And when I was done speaking and I shared that story, I went to the back of the room and I met this guy named Tom Wilwright. And he was like, Brad, I great presentation, but I don't ever want to hear you say again that you want to pay a million in tax and I could help you. And so we engaged and I remember it was September of that tax year and it was September and my tax was due October 15th for the previous year. And that in those six weeks, Tom, I remember your team saved me $160,000 on, on, on a year that had already passed, you know, because for the listeners out there and they need to know that like, like October, 2023, we're paying taxes for 2022. Okay. So there wasn't a whole lot we can do, but still somehow you guys found the way to save me that money. And then the next tax season that came, we paid zero, zero from 965 to zero. So why, what, what, what was the shift there? What did you do differently from 2017 to 2018? Well, what we did is, you know, we started investing more of our earnings or of our earned income into buildings because, you know, the depreciation loss is dictated by your financial investments in these deals. And so I was syndicating deals and taking carried interest in these deals and making income. But we were keeping a lot of our earnings, you know, in a bank or invested somewhere else in some conservative income fund or whatever. And when we started taking our earned income and putting it into buildings, our taxes went way down because our depreciation went way up. And we've been doing that ever since. Yeah. So if you will, can you um, explain to our listeners what you mean by a syndication? Because I'm not sure everybody understands that term. Yeah. So a syndication is a is a fancy term. And basically what it means is you're buying a deal, an apart, just say an apartment building, but it could be anything. Okay. You could syndicate anything. But in this case, we buy an apartment building. And I'll just give you an example. If I want to buy a $10 million deal, is a rough rule of thumb. I need $3 million down of equity, a down payment, and then I'll get a $7 million loan. So a lot of people would say, well, Brad, I can't do that deal because I don't have the $3 million down, so I'm going to go flip a house you know, or buy a duplex. But if I told you, what if I told you with that $3 million down payment that only $50,000 or $100,000 has to be yours, and you could raise money from other people and come up with a $2.9 million that you don't have yourself? And let's say you raise 100,000 from 29 people or 50,000 from 58 people or whatever it is. And, that, and what that requires is that requires, you know, networking skills or being part of a community, you know, being part of a tribe where people are wanting to invest in the same asset classes you are or having access to high net worth people. And there's a lot of, a lot of ways to raise capital that I could teach people, but essentially it's, you're buying a building with other people's money, Tom, that's what it is. You're buying a deal with other people's money, but then you're getting additional profits because you're the general partner. You're the, you're the managing partner and you're the one finding the deal and analyzing the deal and raising the investment and securing the debt, doing the investor relations and managing the asset, managing, overseeing the CapEx. And because you're doing that work, you deserve to take a a cut of the deal, essentially. A cut of the deal. And really you make the deal. When you talk about a carried interest, because this term has been bandied about for the last several years, um, as there have been new tax proposals, they say, "Oh, we need to we need to tax carried interest differently. We don't want to tax them as capital gains. We're in tax them as, as ordinary income." So that carried interest you talk about, that's just you're taking a part of the deal when it sells, right? Yeah. So the way we do it, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. But like the simplest way to do it is like. For example, I'll just say, look, for every dollar that comes out of the deal, and I take 20%, so I might take 20% of every dollar that comes out of the cash distribution. So if we're doing like quarterly cash distributions, I'm taking 20% of that. And then we sell, we're taking 20% of the upside. There also might be an acquisition fee at the closing of the deal. There could even be a disposition fee if you sell the deal or a refinance fee if you refinance the deal. 
And, and I'm not saying I've done all of these in every deal, but they're, they're, these are different ways that syndicators could get paid. Got it. So, so you are doing a lot of these syndications with other people's money, but the challenge is you aren't putting your own money into the deal, right? So you weren't actually investing your, I mean, a lot, you were investing a little, like you said, a hundred thousand, maybe yeah. 3 million, but you weren't investing a lot of your own money back into real estate. Instead, you were letting it sit in the bank or in a money market fund or something like that, or the stock Correct. market or whatever. So basically you were saving it instead of reinvesting it. Correct. Got it. So, um, so then fast forward. So I, I remember you go, Tom, I want a Ferrari. And I said, great. And said, so how are you going to pay for that Ferrari? And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I remember you tell me, well, I, I got to put $95,000 down and then I'm going to go to loan, get a loan for the rest. And I'm going, okay, cool. Um, that's what most people would do. So, I'm going to actually draw this. So those of you who are listening to the podcast, I'm going to describe it for you, but I'm going to actually draw <laughs> what um, what that actually looks like on a financial statement, what Brad actually did here. So um, if we have over here, we have an income statement. So an income statement includes both income and expense. And then we have, sometimes it's called a profit and loss statement. And then we have... A balance sheet and a balance sheet. These are the two primary, uh, two of the three primary financial statements that any business owner or investor needs to understand. We have assets and we have liabilities. And don't worry, this is also in my book. So you can actually go to Win Win Wealth Strategy in chapter nine and actually look at the actual drawings like this. So we have them here. So you basically said, well, look, I've got $90,000, $95,000 of money saved up. This is what most people would do. They, they, they had to earn that 95,000. So you had to earn that money, right, Brad? Yes. Okay. And then you go, okay, then I'm going to go buy this Ferrari. And it was what, 285? Is that right? Do I remember that right? 285,000? Yes. Okay. And so that meant that you had this $95,000 of cash that what you had to do is you had to then put that down and then get a $190,000 car loan. So now what you got is you've taken that 95,000, but the problem is, is that how much your payment was what? $3,500 a month? Yes. It's about 3,500. So $3,500 a month times 12 months that means that that's $42,000. So that means that every year you are going to have to come up with $42,000 to make that payment. And so the question is, okay, so where do I get the 42,000? On top of that, the 95,000, typically we save that up, we earn it. And, and so now it's constantly, we're constantly in the hole. This is what, um, this is what the middle class does right? They actually take their income and buy a liability. I mean, a Ferrari is a liability. It's not putting money in your pocket. It's, it's technically a liability. So, and this is what, this is the, what I call the middle-class trap, right? The middle-class trap is I take my money and I actually go borrow so that I can buy something. And then I'm, I'm in, in hock to uh, the bank for that loan. And I'm basically a captive of that bank for the next five or seven years, whatever it is. Well, so we were talking, I said, well, what a, do you have the $285,000? And you said, yeah, yeah, you had the 285,000. So you could have just paid cash for that car. I said, well, what if you put the $285,000 instead of taking it and buying the Ferrari, what if you actually take that $285,000 and bought an apartment complex? which is what you did, right? You, you actually bought, this was actually a syndication that you were doing um, called Rosemont, right? Correct. Right? Called Rosemont. And so what you did was, is you took that $285,000 of, of cash, you actually bought basically an apartment building. So let's, let's redraw this. And I'm going to show you basically what happened here. This is, again, this is in the book. 
so you can follow, that, follow this. But here's your financial statements again. You've got your income statement and your balance sheet, uh, um, income and expense. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> assets. Hey, I'm paying attention. Assets and liabilities. Good, good to know. That's good to know. Okay. So you take your $285,000 and you basically said, okay, I'm going to buy a $285,000 piece of you invest in that in real estate. But you were just, that was your investment. But again, the bank, like you were saying, the syndicator, I don't, I can't remember. Is this you, your syndication or, or somebody else's syndication? Well, it was mine <clears throat> with somebody else. Got it. So, so you went in and you said, okay, I'm going to put this 285,000 in, but the bank's going to put in money too. Okay. But my investment's 285,000. And so you took the 285,000, bought the, the, the real estate and the result was from a tax standpoint, so this is what's really cool. So that 285,000 produced a tax deduction. This is amazing. This is this is what happened between 2017 and 2022. It's a little bit less this year, but you actually um, got a tax deduction, $260,700. I mean, based on the $285,000 investment. And that's because of that bonus depreciation, right? Right. So, so this was this is a, a benefit. So in other, in other words, have, instead of having to wait to take a deduction over a long time, a long um, period, you got to take the deduction all up front. Um, so that 260,000, then you did still, you st still did um, buy that Ferrari. So you still put that 208, bought that $285,000 Ferrari, right? Right. And you ha you you had $190,000 that you could borrow from the bank, but you needed $95,000. And so the question is, where do we get the $95,000 down payment? Okay, well, when you bought that Ferrari, that first year, you got a tax deduction of $18,000 on the Ferrari. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot on a $285,000 car, but that's the way it works in the United States. You don't get much, you're limited on the amount of depreciation on a car because it's considered a luxury. Um, you're limited on the amount you can take, but still in total that first year, you had 278,700. Now, you were saying that you do pretty well in your um, training business. So you're in that 37% bracket, right? You're in that top bracket. Correct. So at 37%, if I multiply that by 37%, then that actually meant that, that those deductions were worth $103,000. Well, you only needed $95,000. So you actually were ahead on day one by $8,000. So Isn't that crazy? It yeah. is, that is, it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's not, people will think it's ridiculous, but really the government's just saying, look, um, I mean, let me ask you a question. 2017, was there a housing shortage in the U.S.? Yes. So, so when they passed that tax law in 2017, was that an attempt to stimulate building more housing? Well, I think it was. And it's also an, an attempt to encourage us to invest in existing right. housing. Exactly. Because if, if you invest in existing housing, then other people will, buy, will build new housing, right? So it right. all works together. And the idea is... Did it work? I mean, actually, our the the housing um, crisis being um, not not enough housing that actually uh, we caught up a lot in those last five years, right? Yes. So here's the thing: these are government incentives, but these government incentives, while Brad gets to go buy a Ferrari with these government incentives, then you still, but the the government gets what it wants; it gets more housing, and so this is kind of a public private partnership. And Brad just decided he was being an, what we call a silent partner with the government, paying a million dollars in tax. And you just decided you'd rather be an active partner with the government and pay a lot less tax, but do the things the government wanted. So, okay, so here we are. We still have a problem though. And the problem is that that's fine the first year, but the second year, what we have is we have this $42,000 expense. Okay, so how are we going to pay that on an annual basis? You know, you can still come up with the money to pay that, pay that mortgage. And, and the answer is, 
this, this real estate, this is a cool thing about real estate. The real estate actually put in your pocket, if I recall right, about $53,000 a year. Yes. So now we have 53,000. Now, again, we don't get all the deductions. We took all the deductions up front. So we're going to have to pay some tax. And the tax we calculated was about, um, on that was about $8,300. Yeah. Okay. So the tax every year on that 53,000 net of all of the deductions for the real estate was about 8,300. Well, so what that means is over here, I have $53,000 of income, right? Of, 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 in, of income coming from, from there, but we have an expense of, of uh, 50,300. So you, right. are, so you're actually in the black, meaning that you actually come out ahead $3,300 a year because you used the money to buy an asset to pay for your liability. Is that right? Yes. So that's effectively what happened. Okay, so the, the last thing we want to know is, of course, is how you like driving that Ferrari. I love it. I love it. Every time I get in it, I smile every time I start it up. I smile. <clears throat> I mean, look, I, Tom. I mean, I yeah. I know you didn't ask me this question, but I wanted a Ferrari for a long time. But I was afraid to be a judge. I was afraid that people would think, you know, what a douchebag. He's got to be showing off. Buy a Ferrari. So actually, my previous car, as you know, I, I leased an Aston Martin because it's more James Bond. It's so sophisticated. And it's a beautiful car, by the way, but it, it ain't is. no Ferrari. It ain't no Ferrari. I'll just tell you, it ain't no Ferrari. And for three years driving that Aston Martin, I wish I had a Ferrari. So when I when that lease was up, I'm <laughs> like, okay, you know, the, the number of days I have on this world are not increasing, they're decreasing, and I'm going to get the car that I want. <laughs> well, and, and, and see, so here's the thing. What I love about this um, whole example is, all right, so we have that $4,200 payment, that uh, $42,000 uh, uh, a year payment. And how long is that loan? I think it's five years. Five years. Okay, five so year after loan, five yeah. years, you own that Ferrari free and clear, right? Correct. Okay, but the real estate you still own. Correct. So, so while, you're, while you're basically break even for five years, at the end of that five years, now you got $53,000 coming in and you, all, the only expense is the tax expense, the $8,300 tax expense. So now you've got a $45,000 positive cash flow. So basically what you've done is you've actually, because you wanted the Ferrari and you go, okay, I want the Ferrari. Don't wanna, I, 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 I've got to find the money to do that. The government effectively gave you the money because you were willing to do what they wanted you to do and now, not only after five years do you have a Ferrari, but you still got, but you've got forty five thousand dollars of income every year. Yeah, and that apartment building in five years will probably be worth more than when we paid for it. Now I know people listen to it right now and might say no because markets are down, but it's like, look, yeah, it's temporary. Yes. Like, you know, I bought stuff in two thousand eight that went down in value, but it was back up in value later. So it will be worth more than we paid for it in five years. And the cash flow might even be higher than it was when we bought it in five years. And which is not typical of many cars, but used Ferraris with naturally aspirated engines actually are going up in value right now, not down, which isn't why I bought it by the way, but there's a difference between buying a brand new Ferrari, which will go down in value and buying a used Ferrari with low mileage that <laughs> has, you know, some rare features that aren't even available in the new makes now. So somebody told me I could sell my Ferrari now for easily <clears throat> probably thirty or forty thousand more than I paid for it. If I wanted to sell it, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, but but the reality but is, I don't want to. Why, why would you? Yeah, I don't want to sell it. Why why, why would you do that? <laughs> so I I think this is it, it's just a great story. And here's the here's the great news: it doesn't have to be a two hundred eighty five thousand dollar Ferrari. 
I mean, literally you could do this on a 50,000, you can do it on a $60,000 Tesla. Okay. Exactly. The same numbers work. You just have fewer zeros, right? So it's, it's the same principle. And this is the thing. This is works for, this works for people. If, as long as you're paying tax and you're in that high tax bracket, especially then the government saying, look, we will incentivize you to go into certain things like energy, food, um, uh, housing, um, business, those things that we go into, those seven investments I talk about. And in exchange, we'll, you can do whatever you want with the money, right? You just chose to use that money for art. You could have, you could have put it back into another building. You could have, uh, you could have, you could have bought a house with it. You could have all sorts of things you do, but the, the reality is it's, but now it's your money. Correct. How do you feel about it? So, I, so, so tell me the difference between feeling like I just bought, I just paid a million dollars in tax and I'm not paying anything in tax. I mean, it's Tom, come on, it's transformational. I mean, and I can tell you what we started doing now. Please. As we started putting a lot of that money into charity. Um, you know, I never believed in giving 10% to a charity or a church or anything like that, because we just grew up where money was scarce. And when I started making six figures, money was still scarce. Like I, you know, I leveled up my expenses to my income and I just never felt I had enough for myself, yet alone to give away. And maybe that's a short side of you, but that's how I used to feel. But when you helped us reduce our tax burden down to zero, you know, now, now we felt like we have an obligation to do something, you know, for other people. So we have now contributed over a million dollars to charities since we stopped paying taxes. So that feels good too, because now we're not only making, you know, first we made a difference in our own lives, then we made a difference in the lives of our mentees that invest in our education programs. And now we're making a difference in strangers' lives that we've never met across the world. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion right now about tax the rich and, uh, you know, these incentives, they're, they're just loopholes and uh, the rich are greedy. Um, your thoughts? Well, I used to think that too when I wasn't rich. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And, you know, but but I it, when I shifted from, you know, I, you know, I, I grew up, barely middle class. And so the, the prevailing thought was rich people were greedy and maybe they're cutting corners and they deserve to pay more in tax to, you know, now I'm an entrepreneur. And when I was going through that transition, it's like, we're the ones that, that produce, we're the ones that create jobs. We're the ones that create housing, like in my case, or make housing better and cleaner and safer. And you know, I have a good friend that lives in Norway, for example, which is a beautiful country, um, you know, low crime, free education, free health care. It seems like a utopia. But then when I, I went there, he said, Brad, listen, a third of the people in Norway are in the public, I mean, are in the private economy. A third of all the, a third of the people work for government. And a third don't have a job. So like, 33% of everybody employed in Norway works for the government, which is huge. Only 33% work in private industry. And those 33% that work subsidize the 33% that don't work. He told me, he said, my sister is 61 and never had a job, but she has a house in the car. And I'm like, how does she have a house in the car? And he's like, the government gives it to her. She has universal basic income. She doesn't have to work. And she has a house and a car, now, not a luxury house and a luxury car, but she gets free everything, free income, free yeah. house, free car, free education. And, and, and he's in the private sector working his ass off. And he's telling me how there's no incentive to work harder because whatever he makes of 70% of it's going away, like 70%. Wow. So we don't want to have that in this country. No, no. And, and, and the reality is, I mean, most countries actually, Norway maybe being a little different, but uh, most countries actually follow the same pattern is that the government is incentivizing certain behaviors. Um, and here's the thing. I think one of the things, Brad, that I think people miss is they think that the economy runs on consumption when in fact the economy runs on production and not consumption. 
that it's really that the reason that you got tax deductions for investing in real estate is because you were putting that money to productive use, right? When your money was sitting on the sidelines in the stock market, in a bank account, it wasn't in productive use. But when you put Correct. it into productive use <laughs> and took the risk and, and made the effort to actually invest in something that was productive for society and actually created housing for, I mean, if you've got 10,000 doors, that's 10,000 people that have housing um, in part because of what you've done with your syndications and your investments. And so, you know, I've been saying for a, a long time now that I find that um, uh, people who, the, the more tax you pay, it's because you're not generous enough. Um, when you're generous and you put your money back into productive use, then, and, and what you did to you has made you more generous. So um, if, if you would, just just for a couple of minutes, talk about your wheelchair charity, because I, I love this is, uh, Brad's talked about this at his seminars, and um, how many wheelchairs have you provided? Central America, right? <clears throat> We've done Mexico and uh, South Me Mexico and Central America. Yeah. And how many and, wheelchairs? And I mean, I, I can't think of the number, but a, a, a wheelchair right now is about $200 plus or minus. And boy, here's what I can tell you. In the last six months alone, we contributed $350,000. So that's like over 1,700 wheelchairs. And that's in the last six months. Wow. So in the last four years, that's probably been, you know, 5,000 wheelchairs. And every wheelchair changed the lives of not only the recipient of the chair, but the caregivers, but the caregivers. And a lot of these four areas of Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Ecuador that we've been to, <clears throat> the people getting the chairs are really poor. You know, the chair might be $200 and that might be literally like a monthly or a quarterly income, annual income. You know, maybe they make $200 a month <clears throat> or less. So for them to get that chair, it's a big, big deal. And that's why I decided to back this charity because my mom passed from Alzheimer's and I thought about contributing to that. But like, I don't know where the money goes. You know, I don't know how much of it actually goes toward research and the patients versus the organizations. And look, I get you need to keep the lights on and you need to have a staff. But the thing I like about the wheelchairs is that it was a volunteer organization. The people doing it did not take a salary. They all did it out of volunteering and the goodness to their heart. And they're all entrepreneurs that I know, by the way, people that I know and like. And they started this wheelchair foundation called Chair the Love, C-H-A-I-R, C-H-A-I-R, The Love. And they're all volunteers. There's no overhead. And maybe now they have like one employee because it's, it's getting bigger and they need somebody to admin it. But like, you know, you send 150 bucks. It used to be 150 bucks a wheelchair. Now it's maybe 200, but you could change five lives with a $200 donation. Why is it five? Well, there's the recipient and the caregivers. So on average, the wheelchair is changing five lives. It's given somebody the gift of mobility. Um, when we go to these countries and we put the people into their new chair to tie it back into the Ferrari, I always tell people, how do you feel? Oh, I ask them, how do you feel now that you have a new chair? Or some people, it's their first chair ever. And I say, how do you feel? And one guy said, and it's red, by the way, it's a red wheelchair with black tires. And he said, I feel like I just got a new Ferrari. That's awesome. That is <laughs> No, I love that. I, you know, this is the thing is we have a choice. We can let, we can give our money to the government and let them decide how to spend it, or we can actually do things the government wants us to do. And then we can decide how to spend that. And, and I just think that I, I love, I love that charity. I love what you're doing with the wheelchairs. And I love that what you found is that allows you to be more generous um, because you have more, more resources to be more generous with. So, um, so if you could give like two or three just quick pieces of advice to people who are thinking about, okay, I want to be more productive. I want to, I want to do something productive, doing something the government wants. What would you tell them? Well, look, I mean, there's a, 
you know, the advice I'm going to give is what I do for myself. Okay. And one is there's a lot of ways you can make money. You know, I prefer apartments for, for a lot of reasons. And, and, but the first thing I would say is invest in yourself. The best investment you're going to make is yourself. So if you're listening and you have a job and you went out of a job, or maybe you went and got a degree or two or three, and you still find yourself in a rat race situation or spinning your wheels or, you know, experiencing burnout, um, which are what a lot of my friends that are still in the corporate world, you know, are feeling or just feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied or feeling like you, you should have done more in your life than you've achieved. You know, the, the first thing is there's still hope for you, but you got to invest in yourself. Some people stopped investing in themselves since the university days or they go to continuing education for their job, but go to a seminar, go to a conference, find a way to, to, to start a business. When I started, you know, I went to a conference, I hired a mentor. So specialized education and mentorship are powerful. Proximity is power. You become like the people you spend most time with. So if you're spending time with people that are miserable or that are unfulfilled or that are, you know, working paycheck to paycheck, and that's your circle of friends, it's hard to break out of that. So you need to invest and put yourself in a different room, put yourself in a room, go to a mastermind, go to a conference, find other people that are doing big things and learn and be inspired by them. Okay. And that's what we do for apartments. People that come to our trainings, Tom, you've seen it. They come with no previous experience, or maybe they're flipping houses or doing small deals. And now they're around people that are doing big things. You know, we're buying big deals, you know, hundred unit plus deals for first time students. And we're buying big deals and we're changing lives, not just our own. Yes, we are changing our own, but then we're changing the lives of our investors and we're changing the lives of the communities. So you got to invest in yourself, invest in mentorship, get in the right room and take action. Like that's, that's the biggest thing I can say is take action, get educated and take action. I love it. I love it. So um, thank you, uh, Brad Sumrock, uh, Sumrock family, uh, multifamily mentoring, correct? Yes. Some yeah, well, I, and and yeah, where, I, what's your, what's your website? Where do we, where do we get more about you? Yeah, look, it's just bradsumrock.com. Like Sumrock Multifamily Mentoring is our company name, but we don't use that in any of our branding or promotions or whatever. So it's, it's bradsumrock.com. There's no C in my last name. It's Brad Sumrock on Instagram, no punctuation. I found out that I have like three or four imposter accounts uh, it's Brad Sumrock on Facebook. It's Brad Sumrock on LinkedIn. And um, Tom, can I mention an event that we have? Yeah, yeah, I do. Tell us about the event you have coming up in August. Yeah, and you're probably going to be there. It's you're I there every so. year. It's our sixth annual Apartment Investor National Conference, and it's like everybody that's been there, and it's our sixth time doing it. Have said it's the best multifamily conference of it the is. year every single year. It is. And, and why is it the best is because, <clears throat> number one, I teach a lot of the conference. But number two is I bring in some amazing guest speakers, amazing. And people that have been there on our stage in previous years have been, you know, you have, you've been there. You know, um, Robert Kiyosaki has been there. Grant Cardone has been there. Um, Ed Milet has been there. Damon John has been there, you know. Jesse Itzler has been there. He's a billionaire. Okay. So we've had some really big name people. And so not only are we teaching concepts about apartments and syndications, but we're teaching concepts about business, about entrepreneurship, you know, about success. And when you combine those two, when you combine what I know and teach with apartment syndications, with some of the advice that we get from people that are worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that are two or three levels above many of us. It's just the, it's just the most powerful event that exists on the planet. Well, I love it. I love it. So again, the dates are August 25th, 6th and 7th, Dallas, Texas. There you go. August 25th, 6th and 7th, Brad .com. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, everybody. Um, it, this is a little lighthearted talking about uh, how to get the government for, to pay for your Ferrari, but it's really the culmination of understanding how, um, how critical reducing your taxes are to giving you some freedom 
in your life, whether it's freedom to go uh, um, do charitable causes like wheelchairs in Mexico and Central America, whether it's freedom to do things for your family, whether it's freedom to do things for others, that's what it's about. And uh, just remember when you actually do things that the government incentivizes you to do, you're always gonna make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see y'all next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.